good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, dear participants of our discussion. I'm very glad to welcome everybody this morning. So, and let us start our panel, Gender Equality, National and Wealth Agenda. And before, before uh, I will start, uh, I, I have to say that it's a special honor for me to moderate this discussion today uh, at the invitation of the organizers of Ukrainian Women's Congress. So let me introduce first our participants. Uh, we have Mrs. Christina Queen, U.S. Deputy Chief of Mission in Ukraine, who is joining us online. We have uh, Mrs. Melinda Simmons, Ambassador of the United Kingdom to Ukraine, who is from my right. We have Larissa Galadza, Ambassador of Canada to Ukraine, who is from my left. So we also have our dear guest, Her Excellency Anka Ferdhusen, Ambassador of Germany to Ukraine. His Excellency, Mr. Alex Lennart, Ambassador of Belgium to Ukraine. And our dear Polish colleague, Ambassador of Poland, His Excellency, Mr. Bartosz Cichocki. So uh, I have to, to make this uh, announcement of this short uh, notice. So uh, I appeal to viewers who are online with us in particular on social networks, please put your questions to the speakers in your comments. And I will voice your questions to other uh, dear participants. So uh, before we start, I have a very short introduction. Uh, as a diplomat with almost 25 years of experience in uh, Ukrainian diplomacy, uh, I worked solely uh, mostly with the male managers and leaders, with the ministers, with the presidents. But I, to today, I want to share with you my mm, special experience of work in the recent years, together with a female leader, deputy head of Ukrainian parliament and initiator of Ukrainian Women's Congress, Mrs. Olena Kondrachuk. I'm really very grateful to Olena for, for her deep understanding of equality in relationships, in a work, in a world view. This is unique experience for me, which through a personal example for sure plays an important educational and ideological role. However, I'm uh, most grateful for, to her for the fact that she, along with the other colleagues, is the creator of the policy, the policy of gender equality. This is the most important. And the results of that policy we already see in Ukraine. Gender equality is gradually becoming the norm of Ukrainian life. I see this in the example of Ukrainian diplomacy. So for the first time, a woman, namely Emine Japarova holds the position of the first deputy foreign minister. Over the last few weeks, while reading about the recent appointments of Ukrainian ambassadors abroad, I caught myself thinking uh, that among the last appointments, women dominate in numbers. So I mean uh, other new appointments to Singapore and Finland. So by the way, today we have 10 women ambassadors, among 74, if I'm not mistaken, ambassadors uh, of Ukraine worldwide. I would also like to say a few words about the international framework, which was mentioned today by the uh, First Lady of Ukraine, Mrs. Zelenska, which is no less important for Ukraine than the, the, the domestic one, Ukrainian. The government of Ukraine continues to implement the policy of gender equality, in particular by participating in the Biarritz Partnership Initiative, established at the G7 summit uh, last year in Biarritz, France. Uh, it will be recalled that the Biarritz Partnership was launched by G7 leaders, uh, chaired by the President of the French Republic, Emmanuel Macron. 
The aim of the uh, partnership is to strengthen the responsibility of the G7 countries and consolidate the efforts of other countries to achieve gender equality. Uh, I would like to note that for most countries in Europe and the world, equality has long been an, an integral part of tradition, upbringing and education. It is obvious that Ukraine still has a long and challenging way to achieve equality between men and women. I'm convinced that women can and should work in leadership positions, not only in the social and humanitarian areas, but also in finance, in defense, and in national security. And if it weren't for the pandemic, we would probably uh, be talking about that today. We would talk about parity in the leadership of the state, in the performance of important functions in the life of the state and society, about equal responsibility and equal pay. We would talk about the fact that for the first time, a woman, Kamala Harris, became vice president of the United States. That for the first time, Ukrainian Victoria Spartz became a member of the US House of Representatives. That for the first time, a woman, Maya Sandu, headed neighboring Moldova. And Christia Freeland of Ukrainian descent, who is effectively and successfully serving her position as a deputy prime minister of Canada. However, with the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic, which has radically changed the global and national agendas and became a real challenge and threat for everybody, let me complicate the topic and the purpose of our discussion a little bit. Let's talk about how the national governments and uh, uh, national governments of the countries you are representing today in the studio manage to help women working in medicine, education, business in a pandemic, if such segregation exists. So my first question is to Mrs. Christina Queen, who is online with us. U.S. Deputy Chief of Mission in Ukraine. So, uh, Christina, my first question to you is, the most recent elections in the United States and Ukraine have marked historic records of women elected in both countries. This is very inspiring, isn't it? Why it is so important to continue advancing gender equality in political life? Thank you. Well, hello. I'll say thank you to everybody. It's a real pleasure to join you all today. Um, I'm sorry I can't join you in person, especially because I see many of my friends and colleagues uh, with you. But the, the benefit of that is I'm all by myself here, so I don't have to wear a mask. So uh, there is a small, a small silver lining there. Um, you know, today is Thanksgiving, uh, the holiday of Thanksgiving for Americans. Uh, and so in that tradition, I'd like to thank everybody both on the panel and uh, the organizers and in the audience for the work you do and the tireless efforts that you take to advance the equitable participation of women in governance, politics, the economy, and social life. Uh, since my arrival in Ukraine about a year and a half ago, I've really been impressed with the work that's being done here to ensure equal opportunities for women and men, regardless of their social status or their ethnic origin. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll just uh, reiterate that, um, you know, uh, also making sure that we include men in the discussion of gender equity, I think, is important. Uh, in fact, when I reviewed the information for today's panel, uh, just looking at statistics and things for both the U.S. and Ukraine, I was struck by the fact that the U.S. and Ukraine actually have some very similar gender statistics in many areas. Um, for instance, 21 percent of Verkhovna Rada members are women, and in the U.S., 23 percent of U.S. House of Representative uh, members are women. So in both the U.S. and Ukraine, uh, women also make up about half of the labor force. So we are very well represented overall in the labor force. 
But when it comes to women in top leadership roles, whether we're talking about government leadership or business leadership, both the U.S. and Ukraine continue to see lower levels of women's representation compared to men. And so it really is a challenge for both our countries to support women, uh, not just entering the workforce, but rising up the ranks and, and eventually making it to the very top of the workforce and the highest levels of society. So I would say it's a dual challenge, and I would not, uh, I would not say that Ukraine is behind the United States in some of those measures. Um, so why is it that we care so much about that? Well, it's my belief uh, that when women are fully represented, whether in parliamentary committees or on corporate boards or as regional governors, uh, a broader range of views are considered in decision making. And my view is when you have a broader range of views, the decision you make ultimately for your company or your constituents is a better decision because you're taking a broader range of uh, views and perspectives into your decision-making process. So I'm really proud that the United States and Ukraine have worked together over the past decade on this issue. The United States, through our U.S. Agency for International Development, has joined with uh, the National Democratic Institute, Ukraine's Parliamentary Equal Opportunities Caucus, the Gender Public Council and the Ukrainian Women's Congress to promote equal opportunity and gender equality here in Ukraine. We salute the vision and efforts of this Equal Opportunities Caucus to empower women and girls, to promote gender equity, and to advance Ukraine's gender equality. And we stand ready to support Ukraine as it implements its commitments as a beer its partnership member to foster gender equality as an essential part of Ukraine's democratic development and economic growth. So with that, uh, I really look forward to hearing from the rest of the panelists uh, in the session and answering any questions at the end of the session. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. So stay with us, please. I'm really grateful to the charge d'affaires of the United States in Ukraine for, for these comments. And probably we will have some questions from the audience. So uh, I will ask you afterwards. So my, my next questions are to uh, Her Excellency Larissa Galadza, Canadian ambassador to Ukraine. Uh, why is it so important to talk about gender equality on an international level? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to uh, Christina and to all of our American friends. Um, I think there are two really simple reasons why it's important to talk about gender equality internationally. First of all, it's an international norm. And uh, it's an international norm that is embodied now deeply in the S Sustainable Development Goals, in our human rights frameworks, and in the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And they are there not because some organization put those norms in, but because we as the international community decided that these things are important. We set norms for important matters. We set norms for difficult matters. And we set norms where we're better off if we all do it together. Um, so these, uh, these norms were set by the international community and they need to be continued, uh, continue to talk about them there because we have a lot of lessons to share. We have a lot of experiences um, to share and, and, and approaches to learn from each other. Also, quite frankly, it's simply, it's inspiring. Yeah. It's inspiring to talk to other people who are overcoming difficult odds and learn from them, support them, and, uh, and, and encourage this collective bringing up of standards. So, so that's the first reason. I think international discussion really breathes, uh, breathes life into these norms that we've decided on. The second reason um, r relates to the simple fact that societies with, gen with greater gender equality are more stable and more prosperous, and that's just good for, for, for everyone. That hasn't been um, internalized by everyone. I think we have to keep saying it. We have to keep saying it to each other. We have to keep finding and, and, and bringing out the evidence uh, of that. Um, we see how that is true when it comes to conflict, when it comes to rising out of poverty, when it comes to the uh, peace processes, which are more sustainable and longer lasting when women are at the decision-making table. Um, 
and and I guess uh, these are the these are the two. I list these two reasons because they're the two reasons that Canada has put uh, gender equality at the heart of its uh, international. Uh, for its foreign policy, its international assistance policy, um, and all that it does here in in Ukraine, um, on uh, and, and we take a, a holistic approach here. We look after the prevention piece. Uh, yesterday I was pleased to announce another $7 million project that the UNFPA will implement uh, to uh, help 30 communities develop uh, supports and uh, shelters and other things that victims of domestic uh, abuse need in order to keep going with their life. This is so important. I've seen it with my own eyes, how these facilities, these supports help women and their children to keep going. Um, we are, uh, we also work in advancing the, uh, the, um, the rights of women and supporting the movement, the grassroots women's movement in Ukraine to do in their local communities whatever they think is important to advance those things that they, they feel they need. And then, uh, and then on the participation, we continue to talk about why there need to be more women at this key decision-making tables, as you spoke about. Uh, and in particular, in, from my perspective, uh, in the discussions around the peace process. Uh, so uh, that's a holistic approach we take here, and, uh, and, and, and we do it because we firmly, uh, firmly believe that gender equality will put all of us ahead. Uh, Larissa, thank you so much. I have my second question to you. So uh, what is your country's experience in implementing sustainable development and ensuring gender equality? There is absolutely a domestic angle to this. And it was Prime Minister Trudeau in 2017 said at the General Assembly of the United Nations that the sustainable development goals uh, are core to Canada and the, the gender equality thread that runs through them is something that Canada takes very seriously. I have to say that um, in advancing these, we are fortunate that we have a feminist government, a feminist government, self-declared, and a uh, and a multilateralist government. So the commitment, the strong commitment, is already uh, there. Um, and we and and so lots and lots and lots has been done. Uh, last year at this forum, I spoke about gender budgeting. Uh, I think you know money makes things happen, uh, and if you're not looking at your money from a gender lens, and not just a gender lens, but from that intersectional lens that 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 that, that we talk about, um, you're you, you're missing. You could be missing a big point. You're missing lots of opportunities. So gender budgeting has been uh, put in place. Uh, I've talked also a lot in Ukraine about gender-based analysis plus where that plus is all those other ways that people might identify themselves that create a power imbalance um, that we need to address to make sure that all citizens are, uh, are uh, their needs are addressed, that they feel that the state benefits uh, them, that they don't feel discriminated against. And that's intersectionality. Um, another thing that we've done in Canada is... Uh, I guess I would describe it as diversifying the agents of change, making sure that this agenda isn't just vested in government, but in, is, is vested in institutions and in civil society organizations that are given power, um, that, that share that responsibility with government, um, and creating those capacities and those instruments so that it's less subject to the vicissitudes of, 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 of politics. Um, two examples. First, um, we have a, a very strong approach to the women, peace, and security agenda in Canada, again, domestically and what we do abroad. And that agenda and the progress we make on it, the targets we set, who's involved is, is governed in part by an advisory committee that mm -hmm. is co-chaired by civil society. Agree. They have a clear and established role with government. Um, we've also set up uh, the, uh, something called the, Canada was instrumental in setting up the Equality Fund. The Equality Fund generated uh, $100 million of investments from various sources of capital. Canada then contributed $300 million. And what's interesting here is that it's going to advance programs in Canada and internationally that advance gender equality with money 
from different sources and going beyond the simple charity model. I'll give you this, the money, and, and okay. you do something. But, 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 but is innovative and expansive in its thinking about how to advance gender equality. Last thing I would say is data. It's not sexy. It's not interesting to a lot of people. But without good data, we can't prove anything. Everything becomes relative. Everything becomes arguable and disputable. Data doesn't solve all the problems, but it certainly does help a lot. And in Canada, we've, we have created, when Statistics Canada, a single hub that gathers the data that government needs to support its, poli its, its policy making. Um, this is something that I think is really important for Ukraine. It's very hard to dedicate resources to this, to think ahead, because the... Exactly, and it's, 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 you don't see the benefits of that investment in data collection okay. until way down the line. So it's a hard decision to make, but it's absolutely uh, vital. You can't manage what you, can, what you don't measure. Um, so knowing where the problems are, knowing where the disparities are, and knowing then that you're making progress against benchmarks requires data. Um, so th those are a number of areas in which um, ways that Canada has, has advanced um, yep the GE agenda at home. Thank, thank you so much. So am I right that if I will say that the, the linkage, the contact between the government and the policy and the social society is very strong in Canada? Very strong on this point, yes. And who is following whom? I, I, you know what, I, they're, they're, I'm not going to say. Uh, I, I ha, but and this expands back to the first question. The international norms were set because the grassroots drove it. And the international norms are going to succeed and going to be achieved by the grassroots. So I think it's very much a, a circle that is, uh, that is powered by women's organizations um, at all level and most importantly at the very, very local levels all around the world. Thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, let, let us uh, now switch to, to, to Melinda. Melinda, uh, thank you for coming, for being with us this morning. Melinda. Melinda, uh, thank you for coming, for being with us this morning. So if you can uh, share with us uh, your experience and to talk a bit about UK policy and maybe provide us uh, some reflections uh, and observations based on your experience uh, working in Ukraine. And my first question to you will be, what are the UK's priorities today in the field of women's rights and gender policy? Thank you very much. And um, hi to Christina. I'm sorry that Christina isn't with us, but um, always good to see her on the screen. Um, I think it's going to be... I think I want to start this actually by talking about COVID. You alluded to COVID in your opening, opening remarks because I think that now all that work is defined uh, by, what the, by the impact of the pandemic. And um, this year, 2020, should have been such a great year for gender equality. It had some... Um, meaningful anniversaries during this year, the anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, the anniversary of the Beijing Declaration, and many countries, including the UK, have been running campaigns. In the UK's case, we've been running campaigns on prevention of sexual violence, on uh, access for girls to education. These were all teeing themselves up, if you like, for these big moments. Um, and, uh, and, of course, the reason why the UK runs those campaigns in common with other countries is because we absolutely think that it's not just about enabling the participation of women, of encouraging leadership, of creating the environment and resourcing the environment for women to do their thing, but it, critically about the linkages between those. Yeah. Just one isn't enough. You have to be able to invest in it all. And I want to talk about that linkage and what the UK has done, if you like, to foster that linkage in a minute. But the problem is that the pandemic has got in the way. Uh, and uh, the COVID-19 crisis certainly didn't stop us all getting together to celebrate those important anniversaries of those resolutions, uh, even if they all had to be online. But what the pandemic highlighted, on the one hand, was both the most central and the critical role that women play disproportionately as frontline responders, healthcare workers, healthcare professionals, social workers. It also has been hitting and continues to hit women hardest. So, um, so hard that uh, I'll put myself out there and say that I think there's a real risk of a significant reversal in gender equality gains for all of us to, yeah. to address. Why is that? Well, because schools and nurseries closed for uh, a long period of time and those closures increase the risk of poverty, especially for lone mothers. Um, and it's a matter of actual fact that women are the primary caregivers uh, for children and for dependent adults and that has had its impact and continues to. 
Um, women are significantly more likely than men to work part-time so that they can take care of children and dependent adults. They're more likely to be in precarious employment um, and in the service sector, which we now know has been disproportionately affected by the lockdown, the bigger number of people who have lost their jobs in the UK uh, have been in the service sector, people who can't work at home. What is that number, if you can just mention? Actually, do you know what? I'm not going to offer that to you because mm -hmm. I don't know it offhand. Um, but our Office of Budget Responsibility was publishing the proportions yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the proportions showed that it was two-thirds more of people who couldn't work at home than could. It's crucial. In other words, if you had a laptop and you could be at home, the chances are that you have been able to ride out this pandemic. If you were someone who worked in a job that could not be done at home, it was, it was about a sort of 70% disproportion in terms of being hit financially or in terms of uh, job security. There is, of course, this other appalling thing um, of stay-at-home orders, the restrictions on all of us, that have increased the rate of domestic violence. And those numbers are shocking and uh, actually terrifying, I think, for many of us. So women and girls particularly are at that risk of, of experiencing violence. We fund a, a helpline in Ukraine, which in the first week, the first week of lockdown, experienced an increase in the number of calls by 174% of calls of women to that hotline telling the stories of domestic violence. And some of us were at this opening of this exhibition yesterday at Mikhailovsky Square, um, where you see that domestic violence can happen using a child's toy, a packet of cigarettes, a pan that you pick up in the kitchen. So making women and girls more vulnerable in their home as a result of the pandemic, that's something that should alarm all of us. So, I mean, on the face of it, not a good year for gender equality. And uh, I kind of knew that Larissa would talk about gender-sensitive budgeting and, uh, and all the planning. So I thought that in talking about the other side of this, I would take a different tack. Um, and I want to take just a minute, if that's OK, to uh, talk about a woman called Sarah Gilbert. I don't know if that name rings bells among, uh, among my fellow panellists, but if it doesn't now, it will. Because Professor Sarah Gilbert arrived at Oxford in 1994 to uh, uh, work on a malaria parasite. And she moved on from that very quickly to experimental vaccines. So she started with a malaria vaccine. She went on to work on a universal flu vaccine. When COVID-19 came around, Sarah Gilbert was the head of the team at Oxford University that having received the genome mapping for COVID-19 from China, uh, established a vaccine in just a weekend. It took two days to establish that vaccine. The next six or seven months that has seen the Oxford University vaccine um, become a, a, a possibility has been about the trials, of course, and the efficacy of it. Um, why am I um, raising this? Because Sarah Gilbert is a mother of triplets. Her triplets were born when she was a researcher at Oxford University. And uh, I have two kids, and they were born separately. And I progressed my career with uh, raising those two kids along with my partner. And I cannot believe that uh, developing your career in that way when you have triplets. And in the case of Professor Gilbert, I understand, actually, that it was her husband who stopped work in order to care for the triplets when they were babies. But frankly, I think we all know that three little kids who all have needs at the same time takes more than one grown-up um, to care for them. And so she had that uh, additional... Um, responsibility when she was growing her career. So, why am I talking about her? Firstly, because she's a role model for young women who choose careers uh, in areas that include science, technology, the STEM subjects, and she managed to build up her career because in the UK, both culture and policy, if you like, came together to enable a woman like her to qualify professionally, but crucially, to build on her experience so that she came to a point where when uh, the combination of that experience was required, she was able to step up to it. But here's another angle, um, which uh, I'm sure is open to argument, but it's just my take on it. I just think it's really interesting that the only vaccine developed by a team that was headed by a woman. It, it is a vaccine with practical application that I think is interesting that it's distinguished in that way. So her, what I think we must think already, is a pretty extraordinary achievement. Um, and she was listed in the BBC's 100 Top Women of 2020 a couple of days ago with what I think is good reason is to be celebrated in its own right. But I also think that is a successful case study of what women can achieve when all the dots are joined. So when I think about Ukraine, while it is fantastic that quotas for the local elections resulted in women councillors being able to be elected. And you're absolutely right in, your, in talking about women leaders that are emerging in Ukraine, women ambassadors and women deputy speaker and so on. Um, the point really is about what they take from that experience and then empowered to apply elsewhere and further on in their careers. 
I, uh, I visited Kharkiv recently and I was talking to women councillors who had got together and they'd used their experience to create ta task forces to address community needs during the pandemic, which included supplying local hospitals, putting together food packages, they were collecting donations, they were negotiating discounts. So they were using their collective power and experience to take this to the next level in a pandemic time. That's fantastic. At the same time, in my job, and I've been here now a year and three months, the number of meetings in which uh, I've been a minority in the room as a female are st still far outstrip the number of opportunities uh, when uh, the majority In uh, this area, you are the part of major majority. So. Totally. Yes, and in fact, actually, we participated in, a, we participated in a NATO conversation a couple of days ago, which was actually distinguished yeah. Yeah. by the fact that there were so evidently so many women in the field of uh, security who had important things to say about NATO. That lineup was fantastic, but it's exceptional. So I think I want to end by saying, in answer to your question about Ukraine experience, that in this still relatively short time, a year and a few months, I have met so many amazing women in Ukraine who have a Sarah Gilbert-style conversation to have with, their, uh, with what they have to offer, to have so much that they can contribute. And all that Ukraine needs to do now is to join these dots together between policy and culture and Larissa's right financial resourcing mm -hmm. to enable these women to step into that place and make that contribution. Melinda, thank you so much. Uh, you have answered my second question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> uh, but and it was like, uh, how has gender been factored into this response to the pandemic? Well, what measures uh, have been taken? So I think part of the answer to that is that it's actually still too soon. We are still mid-pandemic, and even though, thank goodness, we look to be in a world now where there may be vaccine solutions coming up. Those solutions are not going to be, well, A, available to uh, any of us for a little while yet, but also, yet, but also comprehensively um, won't be for some months yet. So we are still, I think, in a world of working out um, what, what that impact is. Um, but uh, one thing that I noticed from our Chancellor's budget yesterday in which he was describing the economic impact of the pandemic on the UK is that while, for example, public sector workers um, were going to have their pay frozen, uh, and various other significant cuts were being made to the economy, frontline workers' um, pay was going to be increased for next year. Now, you could argue that there's barely a country in the world that could cut frontline workers' pay during a pandemic, but at the same time, it is an example of the gender-sensitive budgeting that Larissa was referring to. Predominantly, frontline workers in the UK are women. Increasing those wages helps with the buffer uh, of the insecurity that's been created by the economic impact on those people. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. So let us move to, to Germany, uh, which is uh, dealing quite well, if I can say, with a challenging pandemic. So my first question to Anka Felhusen, uh, German ambassador, uh, will be the, the next one. We recall the strong position of uh, Chancellor Merkel and her open dialogue with the citizens on the importance of quarantine measures, restrictions. However, the society is now protesting against further restrictions, not only in Germany. Will Germany's leadership be able to keep leading the country through further challenges of the pandemic with the least possible losses? Thank you, Martin, for that question. Uh, uh, hello to all my co-panelists and to Christina. Um, thank you for having me again after last year. I think um, Germany's response to COVID has been um, specific in, what, on one hand, by what you mentioned, the very open dialogue, and that dialogue continues. I mean, you know that Ms. Merkel is not known for being uh, a very outspoken, extrovert person, but it, when it came to the pandemic, uh, she was the first one, and she took over the role as head crisis manager and as of the person that has to explain to the people why we have to go this way with the restrictions. Uh, um, the crisis is lasting longer and longer, uh, and the headline today on one of our main news uh, magazines was, um, is she losing faith or something? Because we had a huge conference yesterday here um, of Ms. Merkel with the heads of the, Fed, uh, of the, um, the federal state uh, governments. And indeed, as in all our countries, uh, we're thinking what else can we do to keep numbers down if we do not want a complete lockdown? Um, I still think um, that the communication is going very well. Uh, we have protests, yes, but they are a minority. Yeah, and there's more and more done 
um, especially on public television, of little films that show what awful consequences this virus can have. We all know that it has very different consequences on people, but I have also talked, uh, and, and only yesterday, to a Ukrainian woman in politics uh, who had the virus, and I was shocked, a young woman who is still so so tired uh, after four weeks uh, um, into this corona uh, um, illness, and this COVID illness. Um, in Germany, we're doing now little films on public television uh, that show what can happen, uh, also to young people. Uh, and, this is, and we confront those who say the virus is not exi uh, existing with exactly that. You need to give it a personal touch, only if they understand in their personal surrounding uh, how awful uh, this can um, uh, affect people will they perhaps change their mind? Uh, so yeah, the, the protesters I think are still um, a minority and let's hope that they will uh, stay that. Uh, um, we will have less restrictions over Christmas and I'm afraid that in January we will then see you know, numbers going up again. Right now they're kind of stabilizing at a pretty high level. Um, what I would like to mention is all this open communication of course goes along with a lot of financial and economic help uh, in Germany. Just to mention one figure, the, the, we expect the whole COVID support for um, entrepreneurs and others to be at 1.5 trillion of euros. Mm. Uh, I, I do have the privilege to come from a rich Enormous. country that can yeah. somehow pay that. Uh, um, but I know that we are privileged in that. And our main response is completely discrimination free here to start with. It is something that we have invented decades ago when people cannot work in their you know, uh, normal work. They get 60% uh, of their you know, salary here, yeah, nevertheless, uh, and 67 if you have children. You know, and after four months of not working, you get 80 or 87%. Okay. This is a huge strain on our budget, but we think it's good because these people will stay with the job. They will not worry too much, and they will be able to start working again immediately you know, when they can. Other things have benefited, what um, Melinda said, to the women who have been suffering most from this crisis. Um, um, just by the fact that most of single parents in Germany are women, you know, most of uh, people working in the service sector you know, and cannot take their laptop home to do a nice haircut or a manicure you know, uh, are women. You know. And uh, there are special, there are special uh, support uh, measures uh, for them, uh, like uh, uh, bonus for, ki uh, for children, you know, uh, special support for, uh, for single parents, uh, um, and especially also the continuation of paying the salary during, as you mentioned, yeah. uh, closing yeah. of schools, closing of kindergarten, <coughs> which really has, um, has hit uh, women, first of all. Mm -hmm. So I think we have the right mix so far, yeah, but the longer the crisis lasts, we will be in the same situation as most of the countries. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, what else can you do? You have mentioned very important groups of people. Can I ask you about entrepreneurs? Yeah. So how does your government support entrepreneurs in the pandemic, in particular women entrepreneurs? And what measures have been taken? As I said, there's, the, the support is discrimination free. It's for men and women equally. But as you know, we have had this uh, stricter lockdown now in November with the aim of being able to celebrate Christmas together. And um, the um, support for November, only November, and the lockdown is continuing now, um, is huge. It's 10 billion euros just for the help for entrepreneurs and others for November. Um, there will be uh, uh, um, a financial support of 75% of what these entrepreneurs did in terms of profit of the year before in 2019. That is relatively high. There are problems, so not all entrepreneurs can uh, apply for it, but um, from what we see here, um, it is helping these, um, these entrepreneurs to get over this lockdown, at least. Uh, the question is when the next lockdown comes and how much money we're going to take into our hands then again. Great. So in Ukraine, we talk a lot about dealing with the problem of gender pay gaps. Yeah. But this issue is complex, as, as you mentioned, and uh, as the state might, must implement additional measures to, regular, regulate, to regulate public as well as the private sectors. So how is Germany dealing with that? 
um, we're not in a much better position than, than others in Europe. Generally, you know, there is a pay gap of 20% you know, percent between uh, uh, men and, and women. Uh, and even when you have the same qualification and uh, work in the in, in kind of same environment, uh, the, the pay gap is still 6%, which is way too, um, too high. Um, and in Germany, um, this is pretty much the average too. Um, we, we have um, recently implemented more legislative measures uh, to, to counter that. Uh, uh, women benefit most of all from the legally fixed minimal salary here uh, because of their high proportion in, uh, in the service industry mainly. Um, we have increased um, measures uh, to help women get back to their uh, job after having had a child. Yeah. So this is something that in Germany, and I'm really unhappy to say that, is still one of the main problems. There's still so much incentive in terms of taxes uh, for the woman to stay at home uh, when you have uh, a husband and a wife or a pa uh, two partners uh, because uh, the partner who stays at home uh, will then give a tax benefit to the partner yeah. who is working, yeah, which is still incredible. I wonder why we still have that in Germany in the 21st century. Uh, but we try to um, counter this by special uh, measures uh, um, of, of paying uh, women quite a lot of money while they took, take care after their child, okay. uh, but for six or 12 months and then get back to their job uh, immediately. Okay. We have done a lot in terms of uh, child care. That was also something that when I had my child was still a real problem. Fortunately, the German foreign ministry is situated in East Berlin. Uh, and uh, in East <laughs> Berlin, we had all the kindergartens from uh, East Germany still. So it was less of a problem. Um, but we have done a lot in that. And then uh, we finally have a quota for gender in supervisory boards. I think this will as we said, this will help on the top in order to make uh, women um, then um, uh, motivate other women to follow their path. Uh, um, but uh, I do have to say, talking about ambassadors, and I was just going mentally through the list of German ambassadors, yes, we have many more, yeah. and I'm just one of the examples. But when you look at, at the highest ranking ambassadors, uh, we have a female ambassador in the US, uh, have had her for two years, that is a first. Uh, we have had a first female ambassador in Israel. We will we get also soon, I believe, that would be in, in the United States, as it was announced. I know, <laughs> and I was happy to hear yeah, that. Uh, and then Japan, these are the three big Great. countries where we have female ambassadors. So all the other of our almost now over 20 female ambassadors are in smaller countries. Great, great. Yeah. Anka, thank you so much. And before uh, we will move uh, to our minority, uh, to our gentleman, uh, I, I, I'm going to ask uh, Christina if... Uh, are, you, are you still with us, Christina? <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, uh, so great. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I got a question from the audience. So if I can ask you uh, quickly, as, as it was mentioned already today, and as we know, gender quotas uh, have been adopted in Ukraine. Uh, in your view, uh, what other important uh, steps and measures should be taken for further support of women and to promote uh, gender equality? Thank you. Uh, thanks, thank you for that question. Um, you know, it's interesting because in the United States, we don't have much of a tradition of tackling gender inequality by uh, putting quotas in place. So it's actually something we rarely do. Uh, it happens occasionally in private sector or something, but uh, for various reasons, partly because of our government system, uh, direct uh, election, not, not party lists, we don't tend to have gender quotas, uh, particularly in the, in the public sector. Uh, but in terms of what we can do to increase the percentage of women in important positions, I mean, my view is that, that we need to start young. Uh, you know, you can't, you, you can't sort of start at the top and then say, okay, we're going to, you know, uh, put a woman in this important position uh, if, if she hasn't had the background and experience to, to take on that position and succeed, because that wouldn't be helpful to the to the cause at all. And so I think encouraging young women to get into uh, areas that they might not already be in, particularly I would say science and technology and that sort of thing, uh, or politics, because I think women don't often think of going into politics at a younger age, uh, and then nurturing them and encouraging them and giving them the sorts of opportunity that will then make them truly um, 
uh, competitive and ready to step into a role and succeed, just like men. So uh, my, my my approach to that is start young and make sure that you get a, a, a cadre of women who are who go through the whole process and who are uh, ready to step into the highest roles. So thank you for that question. And the remarks. So and uh, before I will ask uh, Alex. I just want to mention that in October 2020, for the first time in the history, a gender equal government began operating in Belgium. 10 male ministers and 10 female. So Belgium is also among leaders in gender equality index. So my first question to you, Alex, is please tell us what, are, uh, tell us what initiatives have been taken by Belgium to overcome discrimination and make significant progress in equal policy, equality policy. Thank you for this question. Hello to my colleagues in France, and thank you for inviting me as a male uh, panelist. <laughs> I'm convinced that uh, if we want to, to reach uh, gender equality, and that's we all want, uh, we need to work together, women and men, and change mentality of men. So <laughs> now I will answer to, to your question and uh, give uh, this experience uh, in Belgium about uh, political uh, representation. Um, uh, 30 years ago, uh, in Brussels, in the capital of uh, European Union, there were very few uh, women in politics 30 years ago. And uh, I had a personal experience on uh, this field because uh, I started to work uh, in the parliament after university. And I work, I prepare one of the first law about uh, uh, quota for women in the parliament. And I remember we had, uh, I was advisor, I was not member of parliament. And uh, I remember when we had to, to speak uh, with uh, several uh, political groups, they were against. There was a lot of resistance in Belgium. <laughs> In Belgium. And at the end, uh, the text uh, was adopted, has been adopted. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, now we have for the first time, uh, we reached the parity, uh, fully parity in the Belgian government and the same, almost the same uh, in the parliament. So it's a bit complicated in, in Belgium because we have a federal and a regional parliament. But uh, in almost all uh, parliament, we uh, reached the, the parity too. Uh, my second question uh, is linked with the, with the, with the previous one. Uh, what measures have been taken to combat discrimination in the labor market and to involve women in equal economic acti activities? Well, it's, uh, I, I will answer. Uh, it's maybe uh, more difficult in the labor uh, uh, issue. Uh, why? Because um, you can change uh, by law uh, the political representation. It's much more difficult because uh, uh, all uh, enterprise, uh, they can decide the, the management uh, of their uh, company, their factory. And uh, there are some progress. Uh, there are some progress uh, in Belgium. But uh, it's true that uh, on the top, uh, position, uh, I mean in economic and uh, uh, level, uh, at economic level, uh, there are still m uh, many more uh, men than women. That's true. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let us move to Poland and uh, Bartosz, welcome you this morning Good with morning, us. Yeah. Dobry den, dobry den, dobry ranok. So, uh, my question is, is, is uh, as this. According to the data of European Commission, Poland is one of the EU leaders in equal salaries for women and men, with a very low gap. Can you comment on which measures have been taken by the Polish government and the parliament to cut the payment gender gap? Good day, colleagues, Christina. Happy Thanksgiving Day. At the mission, I would like to underscore that the situation in Poland is evolving in the right direction. We have a positive dynamics there, and we are happy with the vector of the dynamics. Recently, we 
published the MasterCard Index for the business women, and this year we ranked fifth according to their methodology. Last year we ranked 16th, so surely there's still a lot of work ahead, but we are seeing a very positive dynamics. The Eurostat uh, statistics is one of the many, and according to this statistic, we have 8.5% pay gap, worse off than Germany, but it's uh, sixth of the ranking in the EU. And there are different methodologies, as we have to mention, and Her Excellency and Karl Fidhusen mentioned that Amongst the ambassadors, there are more women, but at the top uh, positions for the top and embassies, same with the top earnings. The gap is bigger there than taken on average. So we are satisfied with the Eurostat data on the one hand, but we know that still a lot of effort is required. Let me give you a few examples because it's a very broad topic. In 2017, a law was enacted dealing with the uh, employees working on temporary employment contract. In Poland, we have a lot of temporary employment contracts on the labor market, and the changes were addressed to protect pregnant women. The companies cannot fire pregnant women on a temporary contract. If you're on a payroll, it's an entirely different story altogether. Currently, the parliament is considering government proposal to change the labor code to change the understanding of mobbing and uh, we want it can be considered a pay discrimination depending on your gender age color of skill etc that's interesting but this initiative triggered a very interesting discussion. The parliament received recommendation from non-government organizations, from trade unions, uh, highlighting some very interesting experiences of other EU countries, which focused on increasing transparency of pay. The companies and public institutions have an obligation to annually publish their pay grade structure, whether women earn less or young people pay less. So the entire salary structure putting pressure on the companies and institutions to counter those uh, pay gaps. And uh, I'm certain that this discussion will uh, encourage the government and the parliament to make the decision to combat the gender gap, pay gap. We have a lot of social programs. The government has altered the budget structure, and amongst the social program, there are programs addressed to equal the chances. There are MAMA 4 plus. We talked about triplets, but in Poland, if you have four and more kids, you cannot be active on the labor market with this uh, family context. And then the government would pay, and then if you're not, if you don't hold a job, you won't get a pension. So under this program, the government pays the pension of those mothers. Or there's a program for life. If you have a child with a disability, then the law would entitle you to organize your work according to an individual schedule. It's now fashionable in days of pandemics, but it wasn't so mainstream before. You can organize your working hours uh, flexibly, and you can regulate them according to the needs. 
to give you a few examples. As for the public service, we have interesting OECD data for, for economic operation in Europe. Uh, we see that the managerial and uh, CEO posts are filled by men and women at the rate of 50-50. We are amongst the leaders there. We have a lot of directors of departments, uh, ambassadors, uh, women, but I didn't think it was a general situation in the public service. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Which we can see now these days in Poland. Uh, can you please explain what is going on? And uh, I can mention the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to say that no one can be subject of restrictions or oppression uh, to, of his or her rights. Uh, how can you comment uh, on Poland's policy decision to ban abortions? Isn't an intrusion of women's rights and freedoms to dispose of their bodies as they wish? Or you have you have different uh, view on this. Perhaps uh, let me give you a few details to give you some background. Uh, to give you an understanding of how it works. We are talking about the decision of the Constitutional Court. It's not a governmental nor a parliamentary decision. It's not a governmental policy. There was a, a case filed by the MPs to the Constitutional Court, so it had to review the claim. It had to provide its uh, decision. The MPs were inquiring about a category of abortions, so called organic abortions. When a doctor says that your child has a disability in utero or has some um, changes that are not uh, permissive to life, and then abortion was allowed. And this was the highest ratio of, proportion, of abortions amongst others. And the Constitution Court could not have decided differently, because that's what the Constitution provides. And the question was whether these abortions are consistent with the Constitution. And the Constitution clearly provides that the life is protected by the state. There are laws dating back to 2000, before the conservative government came into power, uh, about the creation of the speaker for child rights, clearly stipulating that a child is a child from the point of inception, conception. That's the law on ombudsman for the rights of children. But the law on the ombudsman clearly and unequivocally provides that the life of a child starts from the point of conception, not from birth. The Constitution protects the life, therefore. So then the abortions are unconstitutional. Now, as for universal rights, a right of a child to live is a universal right, and it cannot be limited by other rights, like their rights of a mother. My right as an ambassador is finishing where the right of a a citizen begins, and uh, I can see it consistent with the universal rights, thank you, thank you, Bartosz, universal your, human rights. I, I think you had the, the hardest uh, questions in this, in this studio, and thank you for your brilliant answers. So before, before we will uh, move to the, to, the, to the final minute of our discussion, I want to ask everybody one, one last question. Uh, common for, 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 for everybody. So, uh, what is the gender equality in your country? Tradition, values, or a state policy? Or it is a mix? Please, Larissa. Very brief. <laughs> I, I think it's a mix, uh, probably starting with values, building on culture, um, but also addressing culture where it is inconsistent with values, including our own historical culture in yep. the country. And 
and supported by uh, the institutions of state that never give up trying to build a better society, realizing that real gender equality um, uh, in, its, uh, in its fullness is, will benefit all of us, means uh, that uh, they won't stop uh, chasing the betterment of those, the, the, the embodiment of those values even more strongly. Thank you. Melinda. Uh, it's a bit, uh, for sure, um, but it's also a partnership. Um, between those who advocate and those who provide the institutional, the resource, the formal, the formal support. And it will always need to be that way. It's Great. not a linear or a binary thing. Thank you. Anka? I can only repeat that. It's a bit, <laughs> I would say, of values and state policy. Yeah, um, and uh, I just sometimes wish Germany was further yeah, in the yeah. state policy. Yeah, the, the values, <laughs> I think, are there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Well, the same uh, values and then uh, policy, because the goal of a policy is uh, to develop uh, some uh, values. And if I can give uh, only uh, an example, and I do agree uh, with uh, Melinda about uh, domestic violence. It's a very sensitive issue. Yeah. So first value, we can never accept it, never accept it, and then policy, a holistic approach against uh, uh, violence against women. Thank you so much. Bartosz. It's exactly what you've said, dear colleagues, but also a philosophy. I'm certain that gender equality is about creating opportunities for choice. One would like to focus on family and kids. The other would like to be active in politics. And we should have no limitations. Your initiative creative, but a woman, and you couldn't do a career then or you have to work because you cannot focus on your child or children. The most important thing is for us to be able to accept different models consistent with our culture and, uh, uh, and legislation. Christina. And Ms. Christina. Ah, she, she, she's not with us. So. <laughs> uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And before I will invite everybody in the studio, I mean uh, participants to the family photo, I'd like to uh, sincerely thank to all partners of uh, Ukraine and the Women's Forum for their support. We respect your commitment to the ideas of equality and uh, justice. And we invite you to continue our partnership. Thank you for very exciting, very interesting discussion. Let us join for a photo. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and can we invite Olena also to?